Hello, and thank you for all of you for joining us today on what is the fourth in our series of webinars on seven challenges for energy transformation. Uh, this Today we are talking about reinventing cities and how cities around the U.S. are harnessing leapfrog improvements for urban transformation. I'm Kelly Vaughn. I am the Marketing Director for Development at Rocky Mountain Institute, and thank you for being with us today. This webinar is brought to you thanks to our giving circles, our Solutions Council and Innovator Circle. It's due to their support that this work can continue on. So thank you for all of our members for joining us today. First, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will start with a, a welcome and introduction from our host, Rashad Nanavati. Uh, then for about 40 minutes, we'll hear from our fantastic panel that we have today who will discuss work that they're doing uh, to lead in the energy transition in different ways. And then we will move to the Q&A portion of the webinar for the last 15 minutes. You can pose questions anytime using the chat function of this webinar, and we will uh, address those and I will pose them to the audience. So we will get to as many as we can during our program. Um, and for all of those we missed, we look forward to following up with you afterwards. We are also recording this webinar and we will be distributing this recording after the program concludes. Rashad, I will hand it over to you for introductions. Great, thank you, Kelly. And if you can flip through the pages as I go, that would be, be great. So to dive right in, we have uh, uh, Lara Cottingham, Chief Sustainability Officer at the City of Houston. Houston, of course, is the energy capital of the world, so what happens here is absolutely critical to our energy transition, not just here in America, but for the entire planet. So, uh, Lara, I suspect for you that is that is absolutely no pressure at all. Um, Lara and her team uh, recently launched their climate action plan uh, aimed at achieving carbon neutrality uh, and followed up just two weeks later with one of the country's largest ever municipal renewable energy deals. Um, we have Chris Castro, uh, the director of Orlando's Office of Sustainability and Resilience. Uh, Orlando has been um, ahead of the game in, in a lot of ways. They launched a, uh, a comprehensive sustainability plan 13 years ago, back in 2007, uh, when this was sort of barely a twinkle in, in the, the eye for many other cities. Uh, and, and I've always thought of Chris as a little bit of a mercury with winged feet. He seems to be everywhere. Uh, I'm, I'm always impressed by how many ambitious projects and programs Chris and the city seem to be juggling at any given moment. Uh, we have uh, Erica Birschbach, uh, the VP of Energy Market Operations and Resource uh, Planning at Austin Energy. Uh, Austin Energy is one of the largest municipally uh, owned utilities in the country, but um, even more importantly, uh, it's one of the most forward uh, leaning and progressive. And that's reflected in their decarbonization plans, but it's uh, also reflected in, in their technology innovation uh, and in their focus on their, on their lowest income customers and, and the most vulnerable uh, populations and communities in, in Austin. Uh, and then finally, we have Mark Hartman, the Chief Sustainability Officer of the City of Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix has an incredibly comprehensive, well thought out set of sustainability goals spanning buildings, transportation, water, air pollution, solid waste, food systems, land use. Uh, and it has a couple of unique features. Um, one is a major program dedicated to the remediation and redevelopment of contaminated land, uh, brownfield sites, and uh, work on harder to abate industrial sectors, which are, uh, as many of us know, the most difficult part of our overall decarbonization puzzle. So uh, welcome to all of you, and thanks again for joining us. Um, uh, I wanted to start by just acknowledging that cities are having a, uh, a pretty difficult moment uh, at, uh, at this point in time. You, deep fiscal crises brought on by this recession. Uh, urban populations have obviously been hit really, really hard by COVID-19, which has disproportionately hurt Black Americans and our most vulnerable. Um, you're seeing arguments against density, against public transit, uh, basically against many of the human interactions that cities are so great at uh, at fostering. Um, and you know we have 
in our metropolitan police forces, our city's police forces in particular, we have perhaps one of our most visible symbols of systemic racism in this country. Uh, and that's all sounds pretty bleak. So I'm going to start by asking in the context of your work today, what is one thing that is, is giving you hope right now? And maybe let's go, um, I'd like each of you to respond to that, but let's maybe go, um, go east to west. So uh, Chris, maybe starting with you. Sure. So, um, you know, obviously the economic uncertainties that we're facing, not just in Orlando, but I think in every city across the country are real. Uh, we still don't understand fully the hardship that I think our community may face. But one thing that is giving me hope is our community's continued focus on uh, sustainability and a, an economic recovery that incorporates equity and climate uh, in whatever trajectory we end up moving. Um, I've been very vocal at the at the federal level trying to understand what a, a potential future stimulus package could be in emulating uh, back in the Recovery Act, things like EECBG block grants that spurred a lot of clean energy adoption in Orlando and beyond. Uh, but even locally, there's a lot of pressure from our community to say, we can't go back to where we were. Uh, we need to identify a future that is cleaner, that's healthier, and that's more prosperous for, for all. So that's what gives uh, me hope and a silver lining, if there is one. Great, thank you. Um, Lara, you wanna go next? Yes, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here with these amazing cities and talk a little bit about Houston and what we're doing and start off with what gives me hope. Um, absolutely every single day in Houston and I'm sure in every city, there is a new challenge that you did not expect. And it seems to keep raising that bar. And, and just when you think that you have tackled something, something new pops up. But what I find so incredibly inspirational is that um, oftentimes when things get crazy in a city, you're told to put something on pause. And unfortunately, sustainability is often one of the first things that is um, seemed not essential sometimes, right? Like uh, firefighters and, and garbage truck operations, the basic critical functions of a city are protected. And, and for the longest time, and definitely here in Houston, sustainability has always been seen as an add-on. And so we work really hard to prove our value. But despite everything that has been going on with COVID, we were able to not put anything on pause, but actually move everything forward. And we released our climate action plan that we've been working on on Earth Day, the 50th anniversary in the middle of everything. And then two weeks later, we announced our renewable energy um, purchase, finally committing the city to 100% solar. Um, I would never in a thousand years recommend doing all of this in the middle of this because it just added stress onto stress onto stress. But, and that's because there is so much forward momentum building within our community around this idea of energy transition, around this idea that Houston is the energy capital of the world. And it seems like the pieces are all finally coming together of this puzzle that, that Houston and Houstonians get it, right? And that it's not a question of should we work on climate? It's a we absolutely have to. And now it's a question of are we doing enough and are we doing it fast enough? Um, COVID obviously throws a lot of those plans kind of upside down, um, but people seem to be really interested and engaged and they want to talk about this. And so I don't know if it's COVID fatigue, they're happy to have something else to talk about. Um, but in Houston, it has a very clear connection to our economic recovery. Um, and so the idea um, that we can build not just back, but build forward um, is really resonating right now. Um, so obviously everyone is hurting and uh, you know, every single day we have new challenges, but the idea that sustainability and that climate uh, maintains to be at the forefront of our community's conversation is incredibly inspiring to me. Thanks, Lara. Erica, obviously a slightly different perspective from uh, uh, a municipal utility, but uh, yeah, I would love to hear from you. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for having me uh, on the program or on, uh, in this event. Uh, for me, there's a couple things that um, make me hopeful. Um, one that is a little bit uh, less local 
is, uh, you know, this we've we've heard the term unprecedented. Uh, this is quite unprecedented uh, for many people, and um, the fact that the Fed and the Treasury can work together has, I don't think, ever happened before. You've always seen when one takes an action, the other one uh, is taking an opposing action, and that's happened because of economic theory for, for, for so many decades, I mean, since the beginning of, of, of those institutions. And so we see them working hand in hand uh, to help uh, the economy, help our entire uh, society here in the United States. And I think they're also uh, setting an example. So I, I, that's something that, you know, Given current events uh, in in our uh, in this time, I'm I'm that that made me um, that gave me um, some hope that um, we would be able to. There's no there's always a cost, and and that that's not a bad thing. But um, uh, just the fact that that their uh, the ability of them to be able to work um, and collaborate and 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 for the Treasury to take uh, cue from the Fed is actually. Is, is hopeful for me. And then to tie that back locally. So, you know, we're in public power. Uh, I'm in public power. And, you know, traditional utilities have been kind of, a, you know, an arcane kind of industry for many, in many ways, right? Um, and for my organization to mobilize as quickly as it did and um, get all my team, our team, our, you know, 2,200 employees working from home without a hiccup um, and to have those critical employees safely working, um, you know, in where they need to work and to have those plans put together, working with other public power throughout the United States um, is just, uh, is really given me hope that, that we can as public power evolve strongly and be a, a, a stay as a very strong, um, value and benefit and to bring those um, objectives of sustainability, of clean power, um, you know, to uh, either customers uh, because uh, you're in a municipal or customers because you're in, um, you know, uh, an unregulated market. So, um, so those things, uh, you know, I guess recent actions or um, what I've seen uh, kind of uh, manifest itself over the last three or four months, um, I think are, are two things that are, you know, that make me think that things might be okay. Yeah, that is pretty remarkable. Uh, Mark? Hey, and uh, yeah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be here. So uh, greetings from Phoenix. The, uh, you know, that gives me hope is, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, um, difficult times are actually kind of the midwife of resilience. Like that really brings things forward. And although, you know, we don't like difficult times and difficult conversations, that it's actually in pain that we actually change. And so, you know, I, I really see this as an important time. Um, you know, we've been as sustainability officers throughout the U.S., we've been talking about equity and it's, you know, people go, well, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe not quite now, like maybe just a little bit, like don't just dip your toe in the water while well, it's, we're not dipping our toe in anymore. And, you know, for things about budgets and things, it's so much with the cities are on autopilot and our community, we'd have this usual suspects coming and giving input to the budget and things we just weren't getting. Now we've had community engagement on our budget like we've never seen before. And really, I think that this time of difficult conversation will really allow a time of building social cohesion where we do kind of articulate what our communities need to be and where we need to go. So it's almost that there's no subject that's off the table. Let's talk about it. Let's have it. And and I think one last kind of comment and is really nice is when sustainability likes to bring together partnerships and big projects and so and grants and so it we kind of become now like a hero. Oh, in these tough times, hey, we're bringing this grant money forward. We're bringing so I think it's like uh, cold water to a weary, you know, to a distant traveler. It's like yeah, they love you know when we can bring this good news stories of you know, that if we want to bring these, you know, as we're talking about conversations, it's pretty exciting times. So. Thank you, Mark.
Yeah, through each of your responses, it's it's sort of striking uh, this theme of how you've kind of, in many ways, maintained or even accelerated uh, momentum, and that's that that is amazing. And and I wonder, if sort of, part of it is um, is just a recognition that that uh, uh, sustainability isn't or can't be, as to use Lara's phrase, an, an add-on. Uh, this recognition that it's so intertwined with issues of resilience, uh, equity, prosperity, and if you're, and quite often the solutions for each of those um, looks this looks the same. Um, so I wanted to obviously uh, I wanted to touch on one uh, issue of uh, which is particularly live at the moment. Lara uh, George Floyd was born and raised in in the city of Houston. Uh, that's where his memorial service was held um, uh, just a few days ago. One of the consequences of structural racism in uh, in the U.S. is that Black Americans are are disproportionately hurt by climate change, uh, just as they've been disproportionately hurt by the pandemic. Uh, so I was wondering if you could speak to how equity and racial justice, in particular, feature in your climate action plan, and whether uh, anything has has changed with respect to that plan and and your uh, your priorities over the last few weeks. That is such an important conversation, um, and I, I welcome you calling out Houston's role because you know on that on that list of things that you wouldn't have thought would have happened in the past couple of months that was at the top. Um, to have sixty thousand people right outside this window that you can't see, um, peacefully um, coming together to celebrate and move our city forward was also incredibly inspirational. And um, to Mark's point that this is something that sustainability officers and offices have been talking about for a long time. And it's something that I have seen an incredible shift in. And I hope it's something that we can grab hold on and embed it not just in sustainability work, but in everything. And I think that's really important because um, while the connection between climate and environmental issues and equity and environmental justice is undeniable, um, especially in a city like Houston, um, we are really working to embed that idea of equity and justice in every single thing that we do. And so I will, I will point out really quickly that in Houston, unlike some cities, we have a sustainability office that works specifically on greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, we have a resilience office that works on climate adaptation. Um, we have what was a recovery office that worked on flooding, but now our, we have a new recovery office that works on COVID recovery. And so we have a, a Harvey recovery office as well. And we have a team that works on air quality. We have a lot of different departments because our issues are so large and so complicated. It's not just one group. Um, and so the, the equity strategy that we um, have been building and will continue to build we think it's really important that it connects to every single thing because it is a network and all of the pieces have to fit together, right? You can't just fix one, you have to fix everything, otherwise you will be pulled out of out of sync, right? Um, and, and it is a moving target and it is a continual discussion. And so when we started the climate action plan about two years ago, really, um, the equity topic was a, a hard one that we had to, in many ways, feel like kind of force, and people didn't want to engage in quite as much. Now people are are virtually banging on our door to engage, and I think that is um, that is great. Um, we're we're trying to figure out that idea though of equitable engagement in a virtual COVID world, because the typical tools that we had and, and plans. And the idea is to go out into the communities that are most impacted, right? That's so important. Um, we can't expect everyone to have be on my email list and sign up for a webinar, right? How do we get that flow of information going in a very real and very um, impactful way through the tools that we have right now? And, and we don't know the answers. We are trying to and work with all of our community partners to figure this out because we have this great momentum from the plans that we've built and the successes we have so far. We have this feeling of people wanting to engage, but 
we're lacking in some of the tools to fully engage. And so I want to hear what you guys have to say. And, and if anyone um, listening has ideas, I think this is um, kind of a, a new challenge that we have. But here in Houston, we're really trying to figure out how can we how can we do this in a safe way? Yeah. Uh, thank John, you. Thank just you. quickly, add, if, I'm, if yeah, it's okay yeah. for me to add to that, um, you know, I think many of us have been trying to quote unquote retrofit these local government systems to incorporate sustainability and over the last decade I think have, have come a long way in that respect and similarly a lot of us have at the cursory level been talking about how equity is embedded within our work and I think we're at that critical juncture where we're going to be looking at how we retrofit our cities from a systemic and structural way uh, in the city of Orlando, we have woven equity throughout uh, our entire sustainability and climate action plan. It's one of three themes that covers each of the seven verticals that essentially are the priority for our mayor and our community. And um, starting out early on, we were fortunate that our network, many of us are part of both Laura and Mark, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, USDN, um, early on put together a training program for our offices, knowing that we were kind of the conduit in cities that we're going to start to bring about this conversation around equity. And we, you know, over the last two years have gone through regular trainings through that five course um, training program and have now started to embed a monthly equity workshop to where every policy or program that we're looking to bring forward goes through this specific lens that we learned about in that training and tries to meaningfully and deliberately incorporate equity, ask the right questions, bring the right people to the table so that the future is co-created with our community and not something that's in an ivory tower coming down. And, and, uh, and so we're at that critical point where I think more and more we're gonna begin to see our offices be that conduit, that gateway for our, for our cities to retrofit our systems and the structure of how we go about running government and, and running our cities. To, to more meaningfully uh, prioritize racial justice, um, public health, and overall equity issues, not just from a racial standpoint, but even uh, uh, an age demographic standpoint, uh, those dealing with digital divide. Uh, as Laura mentioned, we're getting into this new form of engagement and, and many of those individuals don't have uh, reliable access to, to internet connectivity. That just brings another layer of complexity, right? So. Um, just some interesting points that we're realizing, but it is very much becoming rooted in where we want to move forward, where we want to build back better uh, within our city, and, and it's encouraging to hear the same coming from Laura too. Yeah, thank now, you. If Chris. I was going to jump on that, if I was going to jump on that, that I would say that in the same way that you know COVID kind of accelerated society's move to a digital society, it was going to happen anyway, but over a much longer time. Now, all of a sudden, the whole idea of telecommuting has really been accelerated. Well, in the same way, equity, where equity was slowly moving in the direction through us, and it was, let's have conversations in the community, let's have these dialogues. Let's, well, now it's accelerated, and how do we destructure a lot of the things that we have? And we are bringing forward a climate action plan this year, and we're one of the things components is including equity within your section. And two months ago, people were going like, what do we do there? Like, what do we, how do we don't know what to do there. And now it's like, okay, how do we change the way we do things? So it's really been an accelerator to this conversation where we'll see, you know, in the midst of all this turmoil and angst, an acceleration in move of to, to kind of destructure a lot of the things that have just been on autopilot. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Erica, I wanted to turn to you uh, next. Um, uh, you know, taken together, cities and utilities, the utilities that serve them, have this incredible power over the energy system um, writ large uh, that extends well beyond municipal boundaries. And, uh, uh, you know, utility programs, when they're done right, can be designed explicitly with, with equity in, in mind when you consider the fact that uh, the energy burden uh, of our lowest uh, uh, lowest income communities is so much higher than it is for the average American or high income communities. This is work that um, you know Austin's done quite a lot of work. Uh, Austin Energy has done quite a lot of this uh, work in this area of bringing clean energy benefits to low income, historically marginalized communities. So I'm wondering what advice you would give cities on 
how uh, on on how to engage productively and effectively with the utilities that serve them. And uh, I, I might refer to Chris specifically uh, as he works with his municipal utility on their long range uh, resource planning, um, which I think is 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 currently in in the work. So Erica would love the the utility and the municipal utility perspective on this is in particular. Sure, um, happy to share our experience. Um, so it's um, even with the structure that we have in place, which lends itself to, um, you know, as a department of the city, um, I have a general funds transfer that goes to the city um, and the kind of long history relationship we have through commissions and through uh, stakeholder engagement. It's still not just a slam dunk or easy. Um, it's it it is it takes effort and time to understand what are the effective methods and programs to provide that equitable uh, relief. Um, right now, in, in our resource plan that we just passed in March. Um, we have a provision that is going to have uh, our uh, uh, one of our teams uh, in in Austin Energy work with a third party to uh, uh, to organize ourselves uh, to have a very um, almost a different dialogue with our low income communities with our what we call limited income communities. Um, we've done a lot of outreach. Uh, we have a lot of programs, probably similar to a lot of the uh, utilities around the nation uh, to to help with our limited income, uh, with uh, you know uh, uh, senior citizens, with I mean just all the different demographics. Um, but we um, you know we fall short sometimes. Um, you know we have unintended consequences uh, whenever we're trying to promote a certain technology or uh, you know, rooftop solar or value of solar, all the different programs we have, there's unintended consequences that sometimes we realize after two to three years of the program being in place. And it's a recorrect, it's a re redesign. It's, um, uh, and it, and it's uh, we, you know, we're very active with not only our external stakeholders, I say external, I mean, outside of the utility, but you know, they're our customer base. I mean, our customer is, the customer is my boss, right? Uh, uh, and so, you know, we are very active in, in communicating with our commissions. We have two commissions that um, uh, are, I'm going to say like, oh, you know, oversight appointed by the city council. I'm sure you guys have them too. Um, and so that kind of um, dialogue, that kind of um, engagement um, is really what helps us design those programs to meet the needs of our customers. Because at the end of the day, that's really our, that's our overriding objective is number one, understanding what those objectives are and then making sure that when we think we're meeting them, are we meeting them properly? So having metrics in place, you know, that, that, that I track and I report to city council for, you know, internally as well as to uh, the, the city, um, you know, to, uh, to, to ensure that those are, that they are meeting the objectives that we originally had intended or, and has the objective changed for some reason. Um, the city has its own, we have a strategic plan, right? And we, we realign those and, and we make sure that they are aligned well with the city every three to five years. Um, the city has its own strategic um, plan. And uh, like I mentioned before, I think uh, uh, Mark, you said uh, City of Phoenix is, is, is doing their climate plan. Ours is updated, updating this year. Ours is updated every five years. So we're talking to them, Office of Sustainability, Office, the Equity Office, um, how are our programs or how we're meeting those programs, like the activities of my resource plan, um, how I'm, uh, you know, issuing RFPs, how I'm, uh, you know, contracting and creating that obligation for the city. Is that, am I doing that in an equitable manner? We know we have equity training as well. So it's a lot of work and it's really a lot of um, uh, building relationships with people throughout the city with transportation, uh, yep. with, you know, with, uh, you know, just there's, there's five or six different plans, you know, how are they working together uh, to be able to, you know, create the objective and do it equitably and affordably. Um, affordability is the, is the tenant 
of my resource plan that we passed in March, uh, that AE yep. passed. Um, and um, that can't happen if affordability isn't addressed, then those other goals of carbon free, of carbon neutrality, of sustain that it's not gonna happen. Yep. So yep. Um, we take yep. that very, very, very seriously. And, and we are very, we use a lot of, we're very discerning when it comes to things we're gonna engage in because uh, we have had things that we've done that have cost us a lot of money. And yep. we don't want that to happen. And, you know, we, we need to minimize that risk. You know, I, I have I have those in my portfolio. I have those examples that that we've done over the last two decades. And so we use those as don't want to do that yep. again. And so so those are I mean, it, you know, really, it's it's just it's a lot of grassroots work of talking yep. to as many people in the community and in the or, in the different parts of the organization to right. make sure that you're designing things properly. Yeah, and I want to recognize that that uh, Austin Energy, I think, delivers the the second lowest residential electricity rates in in the state. So you're clearly doing uh, some things right. Both uh, Mark, I'm going to turn to you next. Both Lara and Erica s spoke uh, quite a bit about uh, procedural equity, ensuring that you know your uh, uh, historically marginalized communities are are brought into the planning and decision making process. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about about uh, structural uh, equity uh, issues, and I'm referring even here to sort of physical form and structure. Uh, we know that that uh, the low-income communities, communities of color, are disproportionately dependent on public transit. We know that they generally have worse access, which is obviously what you're solving for to essential services. Uh, one of your goals in your plan is to have uh, every Phoenix resident live within a 10 minute walk of public transportation. Uh, we know, you know, the benefits that come from having complete neighborhoods and from less driving. Uh, how do you, how do you achieve that in a post COVID-19 world where sentiment seems to be turning against density, uh, against public transit? Uh, what, what if anything has kind of shifted in your plans or your thinking and, and how do you address this obviously really uh, uh, huge issue that sits very squarely at this uh, equity, sustainability uh, and sort of resilience nexus? Yeah, I think, well, first I just want to kind of acknowledge kind of what's happening with COVID and one of the things that Right now, Arizona was kind of had very few cases compared to national, some of the other states, and now it's actually had a huge surge. Uh, they kind of started getting back together, opening restaurants and things, and now all of a sudden a huge surge in the number of cases in Arizona. And for, uh, for us, like I think of specifically transit that you're asking about, that we actually have it where we're having like six people on a bus and we actually are do, you know, trying to limit the amount of people and putting ads out to say, don't take the bus unless you have to, that kind of thing. Like so, and yeah. uh, so trying to space people apart. So it's kind of been interesting and trying to monitor and manage that. So in the near term, but one of the things, and I think around structural change is that, you know, city budgets that in general, uh, they, and even where transit and where extensions go, would tend to go towards the most vocal communities that and towards the ones that have connections and people that are lobbying and those kind of things and so you know when and, and so very important to kind of say when we actually come up with our plans for essentially we need to say okay let's first go to the underserved communities and deal with them first you know even things like oh, i was going to give an example 311 calls uh, you know, doing analysis of them. I think Seattle did analysis. 90% of the 311 calls, which are information to the utility, came from affluent communities. So it's like, so the cost of setting up a whole 311 is all to the benefit, or 90% to the benefit of affluent communities. So, it's like, how do we do things that uh, would help? And one of the things that uh, I think is really important is actually engaging and have a conversation, not in our you know, um, sometimes referred to as an ivory tower, kind of say, okay, well, let's plan this and do equity and work into these neighborhoods. It's actually getting and having conversations with these communities because, you know, we may have PhDs, you know, and refer to PhDs to study uh, some of these, you know, and to come up with plans. But these residents, they have a PhD in what life is like in their community. They understand, you know, hey, this is, oh, it's too, particularly in our heat, oh, it's too hot to walk there. And, oh, we don't have any shaded pathways. We don't have any, 
And so having those conversations to say, where should our transit stop be? Where should we do this instead of having it just in complete isolation? And we have this really sophisticated transit ridership propensity model that considers census tracts and all those things, but we, they don't have conversations with the community. So uh, we are very much going that way to actually talk to them and say, okay, where do we want stops? What kind of shade do we want on the way there? Um, what, what sort of, uh, we're also looking at a thing called quarter to cool, uh, where they, everyone's within a five minute walk of a cool space where they can, whether it's a drinking fountain or some of that where they can be close by. So trying to build our community so that, uh, yeah, where, 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 and the code, co-create what the solutions are with, with underserved communities. Participatory so governance, right? Yeah. That procedural equity. Uh, point uh, again. Um, uh, Chris, you, I want to come back to something that you were talking about earlier. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that, you know, even with this recession and these sort of cascading crises, uh, there's, there's significant, you know, you've retained significant momentum on your sustainability actions. Uh, it hasn't in, you know, to use, come back to Lara's phrase, been the first thing to go in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, also recognizing that the recession is at varying, but in some, some cases, really deep impact on, on, on city budgets. And when it comes to many of your projects, even if the economics look really, really good, they come with upfront capital costs. Uh, so how has that affected your priorities and, and projects? How are you dealing with the challenge? And also, um, Given the world we're living in now, how do you anticipate and build resilience to future crises, not just physical resilience, but financial resilience as well? Would love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, you know, so first of all, we are fortunate that our mayor, our CFO, our CAO have, have understood the nexus between what's happening with COVID and uh, what has been historically the move towards decarbonization and move towards clean, right? Um, you know, this has certainly underscored at the, at the root, COVID is a respiratory disease. And it's been impacted more so uh, primarily in low income communities of color because of the long-term health disparities that they have witnessed for generations and often being subject to air pollution from our vehicles, either arteries going through neighborhoods or nearby, uh, some of our dirty older buses that you know travel through there to get people to and from and so we're beginning to realize that doubling down on our commitment to move towards clean is one of the most important strategies we have to we have to uh, move towards right and so right now we're in the process of electrifying our downtown bus rapid transit system uh, which does go into some of our historically uh, um, low-income communities of color uh, as a strategy for us to begin transitioning away from CNG and, and diesel buses. We're making a pretty strong investment now even in electric vehicle charging infrastructure for the public. Uh, about a million dollars worth of investment going uh, with our utility in partnership with OUC to land public charging throughout our parks, our rec centers, our parking garages and the like. Uh, and so there is a lot of uncertainty in terms of what the future fiscal years will, will look like. Um, I'm for, we're fortunate that this coming fiscal year, we, we will not slash any of the Sustainability and Resilience Office budget. Uh, in fact, we may grow that budget um, for future investments uh, and doubling down on the important climate strategies on reducing building energy use, on decarbonizing the electric grid, on moving towards reducing VMT, uh, and, and then lastly, electrified transportation. That's kind of our four core buckets of what we've been uh, working towards. And there's a lot of, I think to the last question that you had in terms of how do we de-risk future financial um, you know, impacts, obviously this notion around creative financing and unique partnerships needs to come to the forefront. Uh, and, and we often hear about public-private partnerships and the ways in which we can work with the private sector to, to de-risk uh, public investment. Uh, we're also looking at very creative ways of leveraging uh, things like OUC, our municipal electric utility, for some of these yeah. investments. 
uh, right? And so for the electric buses, as an example, we're, we're um, eliminating the upfront cost on the battery and the charging infrastructure for these new electric buses, where the utility is making that upfront investment and then essentially leasing that equipment back to uh, the transit authority over time. Uh, and so we're able to create these um, unique partnerships uh, through the yep. build solutions, right, through on-build financing, as an example, to accelerate the decarbonization of transportation and even looking towards uh, rooftop solar and looking towards other deep energy efficiency retrofit programs under the same light. I think we're going to see more and more creative financing come to the forefront and, and again, try to de-risk the, the public capital that's put into this. Got you. I'm going to pick up in your, your partnership uh, point. Uh, Chris, to maybe segue to my last question, and then I, th I think we're going. Kelly's going to take questions from the audience. Uh, we, on the partnership point, we we have uh, I think a number of, of philanthropies and, and nonprofits uh, tuning into the call. Um, Lara, uh, we talked about this a couple of days ago. Houston has 2.3 million people. Uh, you know, uh, is one of the most emissions intensive cities in the U.S. And you have about 2.5 full-time equivalent staff members focused on sustainability. Uh, each of you is trying to do a huge amount with, with pretty limited resources. Um, initiatives like Bloomberg Philanthropy's American Cities Climate Challenge, which I, which I work on, were designed in part to address these constraints. Um, if you, Lara, were, were talking to philanthropy looking to set up uh, the climate, Cities Climate Challenge 2.0, what advice would you give them and uh, would obviously invite each of you to chime in? Uh, how can a nonprofit, uh, uh, nonprofits in the philanthropic community help capacity constrained cities deliver on these really, really ambitious climate plans that you guys have, have put together? Lara, you first. Mm -hmm. So the city of Houston, historically, um, but we are in Texas, we are a huge city. Um, but we are a huge city with a small government, right? That's that's just the way we are built. Um, we don't have zoning and we haven't had a lot of plans. Um, unfortunately, right, Harvey and all of the floods that we have had, um, COVID is another example, have forced us to really look introspectively and start planning for the future, which is the best thing the city possibly could do. And However, we need those partnerships, right? Because we have a relatively small government structure, we depend on outside investment. And COVID uh, has impacted the philanthropic community within Houston. Obviously, the energy industry has been really impacted as well. And um, so we're, we're trying to prioritize through our climate action plan, through our resilience plan, and um, through we have a green infrastructure plan showing exactly what the city's capacity is and then exactly where we need help, right? And also showing um, that a lot of people think that the city can just fix things with a light switch, right? That that it's that's something the government can do. Um, and sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is a community challenge, right? Climate change is a global challenge. It will take every single thing each one of our cities can do, but every single thing each one of us individually can do. And that is um, something that isn't always communicated and is so crucial to this conversation. And so we are working internally with community partners, with business partners, with industrial partners to identify what they can do and how they can work with us. And it can be as simple as sharing information, right? The the information network um, that we have is limited and needs to expand. It can be directly supporting the city, it can be supporting partners, right? That the climate action plan in many ways is a map of all of the great things that are already happening in the city, right? Um, looking at who's doing what, trying to bring the resources, be they in the city or be a nonprofit or anyone like that, and then identifying where there's a gap and the city is working to fill that gap and make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. And um, so I cannot stress enough uh, the role that building those partnerships with philanthropies, but also, and especially in a, in a Houston context, you have to bring in the local community. And that means residences, but it means the businesses as well, uh, because third party validation is key. Right? They don't want to just keep hearing from me over and over and over again. They want to hear 
from the constituents. They want to hear from the businesses, the folks who are impacted by this every single day. And bringing them all together is critical to every single thing within every single one of our plans. So Rashad, I, I would, I'd like to quickly introduce as well the benefits that we've received from philanthropy over the years. And what I, what I think has, has been realized is that cities there's a risk to bring on capacity for cities, full-time FTEs, right? That will be continuing to be invested in by our community in perpetuity. And, and often there's this risk at whether or not there's a need for that type of capacity uh, with something new like sustainability 10 years ago or climate action or equity. And yeah. what philanthropy has really done an incredible job at is filling that void, helping communities de-risk the investments of the need for these types of positions that overall have rolled that will overall roll into uh, full-time positions and, and i have experienced six years ago coming into the city of orlando with really only one full-time person working on sustainability and have helped to grow that in partnership with philanthropy to a, an office of 15 individuals full-time and part-time and what happened was we saw through the city energy project working on energy efficiency work thanks to the help of Bloomberg and Kresge and Doris Duke and other philanthropies who placed a full-time person in our office to work solely 40 hours a week on this strategy that allowed us to roll in two FTEs as a result. So with one investment of capacity, we created two full-time individuals who have now continued on beyond that challenge. We're seeing the exact same thing with the American Cities Climate Challenge. And the second thing I will mention is the support of technical partners like RMI and WRI and Electrification Coalition and many others who often uh, provide that much needed technical support to cities to figure out the policy or program strategies or financial tools to hit our goals. And, and, and those are the two areas where I've seen philanthropy step in. And I'm hoping that under this current crisis that philanthropy will look at this as an opportunity to double down on that model of again, adding capacity to governments to work on the important work and two, providing resources so that those governments can work with these technical partners to solve these very complex issues facing urban communities around the world. And that's what philanthropy can really accelerate the work uh, that we're doing in Orlando and I'm sure around the country. Thank you, Chris. Um, I. Uh... Uh, I think that's a good note for me to wrap up my questioning because I know, Kelly, uh, you want to turn to questions from the audience at this point, correct? Absolutely. And we have some great questions from members of our audience. Um, the first is from a self-described volunteer at a small city, which is actually Menlo Park, California, which I know is, is very innovative in their approach to sustainability. Um, he mentions that he sees cities as, as test tubes where boldest the boldest of decarbonization efforts can be uh, really tested and then those successes and tools can be shared with others. As representatives from larger cities, how do you see your role in advancing particularly innovative projects and, and how are you really pushing to share those tools with others that may not have the same staff or resources? Yeah, I could, I could kick in and I think that, um, and I'm sure, I, you know, I'm, it's really interesting for us. We're, um, you know, municipality, the largest sort of in the, in the region, in the valley, but there's actually 30 municipalities in the valley of which we are, <coughs> which Phoenix is one. And we actually meet uh, monthly with sustainability related folks from all levels, some quite low in the organization of the really small town, some more senior. And um, we actually share ideas. We do joint grant applications. So I think partnering with other municipalities to get things done. And I think we, you know, we even brought on um, a person that's actually addressing urban heat for the entire uh, valley instead of just the city of Phoenix. So we were the lead, we got the funding, and that person's job is actually going to work with the entire region to address heat. And so, uh, no, I think definitely uh, how how does a small fish get along while well, traveling to school, you know? And um that uh no i think it's really important to kind of join with other cities and learn from other cities and do joint applications to just really increase the cachet of things that you're doing and uh and it really helps uh really helps actually having other people along for the ride because it's actually makes it, it lets you it let, brings a lot more energy to it 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more about that importance. And, and you're right, the cities are kind of this test bed of innovation, you know, Orlando being home to the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, also known as EPCOT, for those who got that acronym, uh, we often tout our abilities to to be the the kind of the de-risking of, in, of, of, of innovation. And um, to the networks component, you know, I, I brought up USDN in the past. Uh, I think also we're beginning to mobilize regionally. And just most recently in October, we set up what's called the East Central Florida Regional Resilience Collaborative, which now has close to mark about 30 local governments within the Central Florida region who have passed MOUs through their councils to begin to collaborate on regional greenhouse gas emissions inventory, regional vulnerability and risk assessments, regional equity strategies. We're really you know, now starting to work holistically and collectively to address some of these systemic issues. And, and I think more and more, we're gonna need to rely on those partnerships to get through it. Yeah. I, I have one more thing Houston. really quickly yeah. to add to that as a, a resource very similar to USDN. And um, there's an organization called Climate Mayors and um, that mayors who are interested in talking about this can come together. And Climate Mayors created a electric vehicle purchasing collaborative because what we found was um, cities big and small all want to do the same kind of thing. And pricing in Texas is very different than California, is very different than in Massachusetts. Also the types of vehicles that are available could be virtually non-existent depending on where you are, but by pooling our resources together, and um, we created an incredible uh, opportunity for cities all across the country to take part. So the network amongst cities, the, the resources that we have and how we learn big and small is an incredible opportunity and we are all happy to help anyone get connected. Kelly, time for one or two more. Fantastic. Yeah, the next question is on the role that uh, transparency may play in advancing city sustainability efforts. Uh, this, this participant asked about um, whether any sort of sustainability cities framework has a, sort of a, a grading system where, you know, cities can be ranked from A to F on their levels of commitment yeah. or success in, in becoming more sustainable. As we get better data, um, as we have more and more transparency around the efforts that cities are involved in, um, what role does that play in your drive to greater yeah. sustainability efforts and public support of those efforts? I might direct this, uh, Erica, toward you because uh, utility data and uh, customers' energy data is quite often pretty high on, on uh, uh, you know, on the priority list with respect to this this uh, this topic. So um, it'd be great to hear from you first, and then of course others. Please chime in. Well, I think the caller or the question was, is if there's a ranking, right? So I think they're looking for, is there some kind of metric where we say, you know, Orlando is, you know, in the top, what, you know, they're, they get 80% or not. I mean, is there some kind of, you know, way to, 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 yeah. to grade us, right? Um, you know, and, you know, as, 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 as desirable as that is, because it makes it kind of easy, right, for us to be able to compare everybody. There's so many different um there's so many different ways to address sustainability and and climate depending on the profile depending on the state depending on where you are i mean texas has a lot of renewable resources we have a huge benefit because we're independent we're not ne we're not connected to any other grid we're we have land for date we're 800 miles wide we're 800 miles long you know so we're we're huge we have a lot of uh, a, a lot of things that are at, at our at our fingertips and low barrier to entry for market. You know, we don't have a state income tax, so there's so it's yeah. hard to compare utilities like that. It's it's almost not fair. My capacity factors for solar are going to be very different than up in the northwest. Yeah. So I would just be careful with that kind of metric because it might do us a disservice for people who really have more heavy lifting. And yeah, you can you know handicap it and somebody costs them more, so you discount that or something. But um, yeah. so I, I don't know how well to answer that question because i think it's a nice thing to think of but i don't know you know yeah. how much time to spend on that but what i will say as far as transparency is concerned i think this is extremely important and this is something that we take yeah. very very seriously we have a program that we implemented through our resource plan called reach reduce emissions affordably for climate health 
And what that does is, is it started reducing carbon emissions with a market-based solution that my team devised uh, as, uh, as soon as our uh, resource plan was passed. It, it, it identified a certain dollar amount that we would spend, or in essence, re revenue we would not receive from our carbon emitting plants, so then we would reduce emissions. We are, the important thing on this too, is not only did we implement it immediately, but we are very transparent on, um, on providing those numbers so then our community and our customers can see the benefit because they are putting the bill for it. And um, in, um, in May, we were able to uh, essentially, so we, we've, we've reduced a, a close to half a million tons since the plan was um, implemented. And our cost is below Reggie and below uh, California's uh, cost uh, per ton. So we're, you know, depending on the month, depending on what where the market is, is what that number is. And what we're trying to do is get away from mandates um, that end up costing people more money, but look at market-based solutions so then I can reach those objectives um, more uh, collaboratively, right? Reducing emissions, but doing it as affordably as possible. And we are interested in taking that, we will be taking that further from stack one emissions to stack two emissions and to permeating it throughout the city because we wanna be able to uh, associate a dollar amount with that. Sometimes people don't wanna see that, but there is a dollar amount. And I wanna be able to make sure that my limited income and my businesses are also being defended and protected as well. So those are the that's the kind of transparency that I can offer to that yeah. uh, uh, person asking the question that is very important to do. I have, I have a quick I, point. I know we're out of time. Oh, okay. Go for it, Mark. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, just a real quick thing, a 15 second comment is the um, ACEEE is probably the most, the best one now in the U.S. for actually ranking, well, they certainly have traditionally ranked utilities, but now they're ranking yep. cities, and there's a, the new ranking will actually include equity this year, uh, and so it's a really robust tool, um, very comprehensive, takes actually hours and hours to fill out. <laughs> um, it's a and, lot. Uh, but no, AC trip, watch, watch for the ACEEE rankings coming out, because those, back. I think, will really allow yep. cities to point to one another. And there's yeah. a couple, I was going to say, the ACEEE City Scorecard. There's also an organization called World Council on City Data, WCCD, that has worked with the uh, UN and the ISO standard to create basically a global index for sustainable cities and communities. It's 100 indicators uh, now that we've woven into the City of Orlando's plan, but they are trying to do that, an index of cities, and try to normalize it because Eric is very right. There's obviously different complexities per city, but they've really done a good job at trying to normalize it. There's the USGBC uh, lead for cities and communities, which is becoming also an index for cities. We just went through that uh, through through that process. It was a lot uh, and saw that there was a lot of opportunities for improvement. We're at the lead gold standpoint. We're trying to move to a lead platinum city soon. And then I know there's a number of people looking at EV readiness from an index standpoint. Uh, but in short, transparency is certainly a driver for the market. We see that with benchmarking and transparency policies in the cities that have implemented those around the country. And, and we're hopeful that these types of citywide indicators can also uh, move us forward in, in a better direction. Thank you, Chris. Kelly, back to you. I know where. Uh... Yes. We are at time, and I know that we could probably spend another hour discussing this and, and hearing from our fantastic panelists. So uh, first off, thank you to our panelists for joining today. Um, all of you uh, who attended and, and posted some engaging questions, thank you to all of you. We look forward to following up uh, with a recording, and we look forward to following up with the what will be the fifth in our series of webinars on the seven challenges for energy transformation shortly. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to engaging with you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Care, everyone. Really, really Great it. work. Thanks, everyone. See ya.